And good morning again, everyone. 7.08 if you're keeping up with the time this morning. 42 degrees outside, shooting for a high today of 80 in the Hub City. And as we frequently do on Friday, uh, the day after the City Council meets on Thursday, in our studio, as promised, Councilman Steve Massingale. Good morning, Councilman. Good morning. So a long night last night, huh? Yeah, we were there till almost 10 o'clock, so we had a long meeting. Uh, a lot, we had public hearings on annexation, and uh, so we, we listened a lot from lots of folks last night. Yeah, how do you stay awake when all that, that droll stuff goes on? <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I take notes. I mean, you know, I think we all listen. I, you know, it's not always desirable, but, uh, you know, you're there to listen and, and to, to pay attention to what, folks are concerned about and you know it gets gets long we started we didn't have work session yesterday or executive session so we almost went we went four and a half five hours last night yeah so uh i guess were there some unhappy people about the annexation y'all were looking at there was nobody there that spoke in support of annexations last night Mm -hmm. so as you could imagine if someone came along and wanted to include your property in the city limits and the result of that would be taxes taxes then you would probably be upset too now not everyone was up there um with the issue of tax there was just a lot of there were a lot of legitimate questions last night regarding annexation yeah Hmm. well uh can you go into more detail about this annexation are we talking about specifically yes what part of town are we talking about here yeah good point dave uh so we had hearings on three different annexations and last night, and um, one is up around the airport, and um, it includes um, some land around the airport. Believe it or not, some of our airport, our city-owned airport, wasn't in the city limits, and it does some things for us. Uh, and then there's a couple of parcels on the. Um, that's what I was looking for. I was going to give you the specific boundaries, and I flipped away from it, but. There's one. Oh, here it is right here. So um, the other parcel is going to be um, north of Erskine, uh, west of Frankfurt. Um, and then there's another piece down here that uh, the south border is Marsha Sharp. The eastern border is Upland. <laughs> Sorry, I left my glasses. And the the it's a west, really tiny map. The <laughs> western border is Alco. Uh, yeah, I will say that one thing we can do a better job of at the city is the graphical representations of some of these <laughs> presentations. But so is, are these the same ones that y'all were talking about a couple of councils ago? Uh, no, great no? point. So those were petitioned annexations. Those were uh, people that came to the city and asked to be annexed. So they came and said, please take us in. Most of the time, those are developers with uh, raw land, so there's no residents there to be right. affected or impacted. These three um, are products of a process started by prior council. Uh, we, you know, we have a uh, they created an annexation and growth committee, which looks at those things that are beneficial to to the growth of, and the development of the city. And so these came up through that citizen led process, um, and what we're going through and started to, to last night is the the process required by state law to consider those. So the first hearing was last night. The second hearing will be, I mean, the, 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 the last night was the second public hearing. April 12th will be the first reading of the ordinance. And April 26th will be the second reading of the ordinance. Nothing's been decided. All of this is going through a process to hear from those affected, hear what the impact of the annexation would be, what the advantages are to the overall city, and from there the uh, council will make decisions. Um, We all took pages and pages and pages of notes last night. People were concerned, obviously, with taxes. People were concerned with timeliness of delivery of services. You know, when would they get fire protection? When would, would they have trash collection? Um, people are concerned in these areas of, about whether or not they could uh, keep their animals. And, um, you know, and to answer that question, uh, yes, they're, they're, 
their grandfather. That that's that's non-conforming. So if you had three horses and you were going to be annexed, you would always be able to have three horses. Forever. Yes, sir. Until you sold the land. I believe it goes with I believe it goes, it goes with, with the, the land. land. Now, oh, okay. You couldn't have five horses. Yeah. You can have what you have when you're annexed. Gotcha. Uh, mm. there were some folks that had questions about fireworks stands. Say I live out. Unfortunately, that's one of the, one of the situations under under law that once it beca- lies inside the city limits, you would not be able to have a fireworks stand on that land. So just lots and lots and lots of questions and the takeaway is council will now sit down with city staff and our manager, uh, Jared Atkinson, and we will uh, filter through all these questions and try to answer them. Well, you know, this, uh, it, it, truthfully, <clears throat> somebody that has a piece of land out there and maybe a house and maybe, you know, valued at uh, $200,000 or so, they're talking about paying uh, in excess of $3,000 a year in city taxes. So Absol- that's not a small thing. Absolutely. You know, I would say one underlying theme amongst all the people that spoke last night, and there's a lot of people that spoke that if we could answer their questions, they probably wouldn't have issues. But the communication on this, and I think it's probably a two-way street. I think the city can always communicate better. Um, and I think people could pay attention better. You know, I, I there's just, you know, people don't understand the taxes. People just don't understand the taxes. They don't understand how to calculate them, and they don't understand the impact. And some of those things are simple things that uh, we can communicate better. Yeah. Well, we have a text messenger this morning that says, did you ask those people who live there if they want to be annexed? We didn't have to ask them. They were very vocal to tell us that they did not want to be annexed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more than happy to tell you. Huh? And so nobody nobody was speaking for, I, I take it. No, and I think you have to understand this is probably, at this point, this is still an open-minded process. I mean, this is a process that we've adopted as a as as a city, and we're going, we're going, we're moving through that process, and I, council will consider everything before they make a final decision. So let me ask you this. Uh, as far as the annexes are concerned, um, has the council ever heard – people there and then decided not to annex a portion of land uh, in sure. recent history. Well, I can't cite it for you, but yeah. sure, that yeah. will happen. And, and that could likely happen here. Uh, there could be part of the proposed areas that, that are on this map I have today that might get carved out. I think everything's on the table as we move through it. Well, another texture, uh, well, uh, this is the same texture that texted back and says, so why are we, uh, why are you annexing them? <laughs> what? Well, it, it's just a matter of, uh, well, you, you explain it better than I can, I'm sure. So I can, I can, I can tell you some things that are considered. Um, um, some people are, some people do. There are a need for services out there. There's also a need when you look at annexa- annexation and you look at zoning and planning. All of these things are about protection of property. Um, there are times for example if you lived on the inside border of the city and you spent a lot of money on a residential property or commercial property and someone right outside the city limits did something that was detrimental to you and you were right next door to them at some point the city has to protect what what it has and protect the property of of those inside there's also considerations of we have to get ahead of transportation needs and making sure that we can continue to build thoroughfares out. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of things that, that are you consider as you move through yeah. the process. Let's take, a, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back and uh, talk more with Councilman Massengill about what's going on in our city of Lubbock after this. News Talk 95.1 FM and 790 AM. We are KFYO Mornings. Dave King, Matt Martin here. Along with uh, our guest this morning is Council, City Councilman uh, Steve Massengale, uh, fresh out of the uh, yesterday's uh, council meeting with some new information. We've talked about annexation for the first break, but uh, uh, of course, the, probably the bigger news is ERCOT, wouldn't you think? Yeah, t- yeah, 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 Dave. It, yesterday was a big day uh, for us. Um, the PUC, the Public Utility Council of Texas, actually issued the order for our move to ERCOT. And I know everyone's paid attention. That's really been about a three- or four-year process um, to move us on and connect to probably what's considered the 
most competitive, efficient electric grid in the country, maybe the world. And so we've got the green light on that, and it's very exciting. It's going to allow us to deliver um, competitive power, competitive choice to our retail customers. And uh, we'll start the process here to get connected, and we hope that on June 1, 2021, we're going to um, we'll flip the switch and we'll be um, receiving power from the ERCOT grid, which does a lot of things. Say, say again, when? June 1, 2021. <clears throat> well, that's a ways off. Okay. Yeah. So, um, could you go over the numbers of that? Because I know that there's some big numbers, and a lot of people want to know how much is this going to cost. Right. So there is a um, you go you it's it's complex, but you go through a series of negotiations, and we agreed on a cost of entry to pay twenty two million dollars a year for five years. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that is a uh, cost of entry to the ERCOT grid. And through a series of calculations, that's covers the co- the increased cost to everybody else on the grid as we move in. Mm-hmm. But, uh, it does, there are big numbers involved and it, it sounds crazy, but LP and L is a big business. Remember we're the third largest municipal municipally owned utility mm-hmm. in the state. And uh, we're one of the largest in the country. And it's we're, we're plowing new ground for a municipality to join the ERCOT grid. I think the only other ones that are there were there when it was created. There's people all over the state watching what we did. The point with the dollars is, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's we save money moving off of the wholesale power we buy from Excel, moving on to the ERCOT grid. Now, you said $22 million a year. For five years. For five years. $22 million each year for five years? Yes, sir. Well, don't forget. I, I understood but it was $22 million over five years. Well, okay, well, here's mm. my question is, uh, I mean, $22 million sounds like an awful lot of money. It's however, a ton of money. However, it's relative to the total uh, that, that LP&L uh, builds or, or goes through in a year. Do you have any idea what that is? Well, you have to look at, well, it's a lot, but, um, when we're current, the way our current, uh, situation works is we have fees that, that we have to pay. Um, they're called congestion fees and other fees that we won't have to pay, um, as we move into ERCOT. Sometimes you'll get, you'll, 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 you'll see the EUB reports. I don't know. I've heard I, 7 million sticks in my mind, but we won't be paying those fees when we move into ERCOT and we get transmission revenue and the transmission, re- we don't get any transmission revenue. Now, when we build out and connect, we'll get the benefit of, and, and cause, um, ERCOT shares that transmission revenue and for everything we build, we'll get our share. And that outweighs the 22 million what does it really so that's where you, you that's where we say there'll be cost savings and there hasn't been any way that i've seen this and i've spent a lot of time on this that with the numbers and the cost we have today that when we flip the switch so to speak we won't that rate payers will save money their rates should go down okay, okay. Of course, one of the big issues is it's only going to be for about 70% of Lubbock citizens. You're correct. So, What uh, about the other 30? We're working hard to figure that one out. Okay. So do we have a, I mean, I've asked before, but uh, do we have a map? Do we know who these 30% are? It's ran, it's it's scattered all through the city, so there's not a map where I can draw a, bo- draw a box around it. Other yeah. side. This is KFYO Mornings. Dave King and Matt Martin here. KFYO, uh, again, 42 degrees as you arise this morning on a Friday, uh, shooting for a high today of 80, and it is uh, 7.29 a.m. We'll be back with one last segment with our city councilman after this break. News Talk 95.1 FM, 7.90 a.m. This is KFYO, and we're back with uh, city councilman Steve Massengale, and we were talking about ERCOT. Where were we on the ERCOT well, conversation? I think, I think you had a question. Yeah, there. Matt's question. Well, the the question I had, I'm going to ask you the same one I kind of asked during the break: is how 
how were those 30% decided? I mean, how did we end up with 30%? That, that, that's a product of the acquisition of, of Excel and how those citizens or how those rate payers are connected into that grid. And then there's a separate purchase power agreement around uh, though that group of um, customers. And so, you know, we all, the council's unanimous on this. I mean, we want, and I think the EUB is also, is that we're going to do everything we can to find a way to um, resolve that. You know, I have to keep in mind, there are parts of the city as we talk about this that aren't on LPNL and, and are in a different, jur- you know, the jurisdiction of uh, SPEC and they, they won't have competitive power. And um, so there are, st- there are some other areas also that won't. Okay. Well, uh, one other question I had is that last summer um, there were a lot of brownouts in the ERCOT system. Um, does that worry us as we're trying to get patched into ERCOT? Do we have any uh, guarantees by them? They're going to be ready for us as we get into the system. And are they going to have their power grid figured out to the point where we're not going to be getting brownouts during the during the summer? Yeah, I can't speak to the brownouts, but um, we've been reassured that they, they have plenty of power. We've, we've had discussions about they have excess power, wind power up in this part of the world that we actually, our load helps the grid. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think ERCOT's um, prepared so, to, to, to take us on. Are all these windmills that we see around in our part of the country, are they, uh, are they fed into uh, ERCOT? I think those the, the ones you see as you drive through Sweetwater are. That's all in part of the ERCOT system? Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Um, uh, well, that's a, that probably about covers the ERCOT s- situation. What, what we, uh, what about Citizens Tower? It, it just seems like they've completely demolished it. You, you know, can see through it. Well, it's <laughs> you know, you can, and, and they, they're, they're taking the windows off and it will the, sometime <laughs> later this year, they'll go back up, but they're just continuing to prep it. Uh, and the prep is the, um, uh, agonizing part. I, I can sympathize. I've, we've just gone through a remodel at our house and you're like, gosh, they're prepping for paint forever. But, um, you'll see, you'll see some things go up. The, the parking garage will come down relatively soon. We've done all the demolition. And, uh, so anyway, uh, later in the year, you'll see positive progress on that. Well, I hope so. Well, I've, I've got some questions about the auditorium Coliseum. Um, one is this, uh, I guess this election that we just had, uh, does that worry the council at all that, that maybe the citizens would vote against getting rid of those in lieu of, of taxes maybe that would cause problems elsewhere, having to build another Coliseum or something equivalent? Well, I guess what, what I saw, uh, in the elections were, uh, the conservative voters that we all know here in our community and, I think if you take a conservative approach and you look at what the Coliseum's costing us and, and the deferred maintenance that I don't think anyone's willing to invest, I think they'll probably continue to support uh, giving the Coliseum Auditorium back to Texas Tech. So have, uh, as far as the deferred maintenance is concerned, um, Paul Bean was on our program, mm-hmm. and he said that he believed that a lot of um, some payments or some people that were working for maybe uh, the Coliseum, the auditorium, and the Civic Center, like kind of working all of them, that those bills may be over on this, uh, the Coliseum auditorium. Are there any things that are over there that are actually things we're going to have to pay even if we don't have that as part of that deferred maintenance? So I would say or, some uh, of that... Well, not that. Uh, the 700000 we're losing every year. Sure. So some of that mixed, sure. and we're going to have to pay it anyway. Yeah, I mean, um, I think he's... Some of that is correct, uh, but we had we our city manager took care of that prior to our analysis on these numbers. There were, were I'm a, you know s- some things that were charged to Coliseum that should have been at Civic Center, but those those are all cleaned up. And when we look at our analysis now, uh, there's really not a whole lot of evidence of that. So, so uh, the seven hundred thousand a year is still that's how much we're losing every year uh, after everything's been cleaned up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've gone over it and over it and over it, and it's uh, it, it's a money loser every year. And and it doesn't take long to look at it because you're not filling it up. It's not being used. I mean, if 
you know, yeah. we've all had businesses here. You know, you got to bring revenue in all the time to make things work, and that's not happening over there. So, yeah. do we have people that are going out trying to fill these up, or have we gotten to the point where we just feel like it's time to move on? Well, I think the you know, I think you let the mar- the market determine that, and when people who have events and are looking at things. Uh, to place their events, they know what's available out there. They're not coming and knocking on the door of the Coliseum. It's not ADA compliant. The the bathrooms are substandard. Uh, it needs a roof. Um, three of the four air handlers are out. It has lots of issues. I mean, my family we we have a have had an annual event there every June, and probably for like the last ten years in the auditorium, and uh, it's. It's not equipped to handle that many people. If you have somebody in a wheelchair, the the ramp down to the stage is way too steep. Uh, the bathrooms can't handle the load. It's it's been a great asset to the city. It's outlived its useful life. So, what are the talks now as far as possibly building something to take place of the Coliseum? Nothing definitive. Our uh, Mayor Dan Pope's leading some discussions with I think what we would hope or potential maybe partners or maybe if we can just lead the discussions and and they can take it from here uh, there's been the city and the in texas tech and the county and the fair board have all been in discussions i have not been part of those meetings but the um the intent is to find a solution for some type of exposition center i do think we all believe that we live in the part of the world that uh, we could keep an exposition center busy many weekends out of the year uh, and so, you know, I think he will continue to lead those conversations, and um, uh, we hope to have some alternative for those events like the rodeo okay. and others to have their um, continue to do what they do best. I'm, I'm going to ask one more quick question, and I'm, I'm sorry, Connor, I know you're going to get mad, but um, is there a plan B if the voters do not choose uh, to vacate those, those properties? I think if the voters choose not to vacate it, then we'll sit down as a council and decide um, how to move forward. I mean, there's a point. There's we're quickly approaching a point in that facility that if a, something mechanically fails, there's not the money to fund it, and we'll, you know, that's why we're elected to make the hard decisions. And I guess we'll take it from there and decide what we want to do with it. Yeah. All right. Is Thank there anything much. quickly that uh, that you want to that, any personal issue that you want? Well, not a personal issue. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do we have another hour or two? No, I'm. I'm any I'm, any topic that you no, uh, I, that I, we have I, failed to cover that I, you want to cover? No, Dave. I think the most important things this morning are understanding that this annexation process has started, and that uh, to celebrate the um, the order issued by the PUC okay. yesterday, moving into our. Well, copy. Councilman I, Steve Massengill, we we appreciate you coming in so much, and uh, thanks share, for having me. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We'll be back with more after this.